would you say that um, as it relates to women and girls and you know just overall sexual and reproductive rights, do you think that um, there's ongoing a lot of ongoing dialogue about that in your country? Do you think that you see where women activists or women advocates are you know speaking up about you know just their overall acceptance and inclusion within the climate space? What would you say has been your experience? For people and activists in the movement, of course, it's really good, but really in society, it's still not there. Our president says things like shooting down women rebel fighters in the vagina so that they become useless and, you know, normalizing harassment and just kissing girls without their consent and saying that it's just a joke. It's all these things that really, from the leaders, it's really just bleeding into people also. And it's this reflection in society of seeing girls and activism, both as terrorists and people as who yeah. shouldn't be um, uh, taken seriously. So it's really that coming together, which makes climate activism, especially for young girls in the Philippines, and I'm sure in your country also, so much more difficult. But how is it in your country? One of the things that we have also recognized is that there's a lot of issues surrounding sexism and ageism within the space. So young people are considered as being too young to understand or to contribute to the conversation. You were born yesterday. How are you able to speak on this? You don't necessarily have that experience or expertise. And then there's the idea again of sexism. So a lot of young activists are seen as, oh, you're a feminist trying to overthrow a man or you're trying to, you know, remove the male um, from the conversation. You hear about us trying to dismantle the patriarchy and it's seen as something so negative. And for me, I don't even think people recognize that feminism is not about overthrowing or, you know, removing. It's about equality and equity and creating that space for women to have their voices, you know, heard within um, ongoing conversations, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be climate change advocacy, whether it be about women's rights and abortion, we still see these things being played out where women are not necessarily at the forefront of the challenges that continue to face them. So yeah, I totally can see where we need to improve in that regard for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I think it's the same with the climate crisis, that it's the global north white men leaders um, making all the decisions oh, yeah. despite not <laughs> seeing the impacts of the climate crisis themselves. It's really a systemic yep. problem where, again, as you've mentioned time and time again, it's the most marginalized who are left behind. So as climate activists and as activists, and I think as people, you even have to be yeah. an activist to do this, our mandate should be always empowering and listening to and amplifying being in solidarity with the most marginalized so that we have a world where no one is left behind but what are are, are pretty much your thoughts on who you think is heard most during conversations about the climate crisis and who are the individuals that are being left out of these conversations definitely it's the people who are who have the strongest resistance and who are yeah. the least responsible and who are most vulnerable who are left out of these conversations. I am from the global south, I am a woman, I am a person of color, but I don't see myself as the one who is the most marginalized, right? Like yeah. In my country, I have the privilege for education, to have access to the internet, to speak English. There's they have very different levels of privilege and it's a definitely a spectrum that we have to talk about. And while I am grateful that my voice is being heard, there are so many voices that also need to be amplified so much more. And these are the people who really need to be heard. Usually these people don't even call themselves climate activists. They don't even yeah. see themselves as defenders of the environment. Instead, they're defending their lives and their livelihoods yeah. and their cultures. So for me, I think the persons who continue to be left out, as you rightly said, are those whose lives, livelihoods, lives of their children, you know, their day-to-day -day existence is so um, impacted by the climate um, crisis. And oftentimes there are the scholars and the academics and, you know, consultants and, you know, individuals at government level who often, you know, speak on their behalf. And I remember speaking to a young lady in one of these communities and she said, you know, this idea of saving um, us is not something that you need to think about. We don't necessarily need to be saved, we just need to be listened to and armed with the resources to be able to, you know, build our own resilience and capacities. So for me, there is a complex that we have that we need to save um, individuals almost from themselves. But if we think about it, the problem isn't necessarily being created by them, it's being created by other people and they have to, you know, just absorb and, and deal with all the problems that come with development 
but for us um, we recognize that they have all the knowledge they are champions and activists in their own right they just need to be provided with the resource and people need to listen to them 